Namaste. So we're going to continue to the next Adhikarana of Vedanta Sutra, which is that the creator of the world is the conscious Atman, Brahman, and cannot be matter. You see, in Indian philosophy, uh, there are also materialists, uh, the Charvakas, the Sankhyas, or some of the Sankhyas. There's atheistic Sankhya and there's theistic Sankhya, but here we're talking about the atheistic Sankhya, uh, which states that the world comes from matter, that maybe God creates matter in the beginning, but after that, everything is done uh, by physical laws. And they talk about the pradhan. The pradhan is the a sum total of all material elements and how everything is derived from that. Well, of course, the Vedas don't agree. <laughs> the Vedas say that in the beginning was only Brahman and everything came from him and was shaped by him, by his intelligence, by his consciousness. So let's look at some of the Upanishadic texts that refer to this. Being only, my dear, this was in the beginning, one only without a second. It thought, may I be many, May I grow forth, it projected fire. The Atman willed, let me project worlds, so it projected these worlds. It is said of the person of 16 parts, he thought, he sent forth prana. There cannot be any thinking or willing in the insentient pradhan. It is possible only if the first cause is an intelligent being like Brahman. He grasps without hands, moves without feet, sees without eyes, hears without ears. He knows what can be known, but no one knows him. They call him the first, the great person. He, the God of all souls, is the creator of the world. And Shankaracharya comments, you cannot attribute sentiency, chaitanatva, to pradhan, even in a figurative sense, because it is said that the creator became the soul and entered the body. How can the insentient matter, achetana, become the sentient soul, chaitana? Vedic texts emphatically declare that by knowing Brahman, everything else can be known. How can we know the souls by knowing matter? Thus, in all Vedantic texts, there is a uniform declaration that Chaitana, consciousness, is the cause of the world. So this is what the scriptures say, all of the scriptures. Even the non-Vedic scriptures, except for the Buddhists, <laughs> they say that the world sprang into being basically automatically, and there is no cause. How is that possible? Whenever we see an effect, there's always a cause. So that argument is out the window. But the argument of the Sankhyas has become the dominant view in human society. Now, of course, we call them scientists instead of Sankhyas. <laughs> well, actually, science, the word science comes from Sankhya. And it means to know. And what, is, what does it mean to know is to divide everything into classifications. So we see the earliest science back in the days of the Greeks was the classification of the biological species and so on into different phyla and families 
and, and like that. And the classification of the material elements, the chemical elements. But all of this misses the real point. The scientists claim that matter existed in some primordial form, the Big Bang or whatever, and then it gradually condensed into the forms that we see today, and life evolved, and so on and so forth. And of course, well, there are many problems with this theory. First of all, it's just a theory, and it will always be a theory, because even though the scientists claim to be ex based on experimentation and observation, Actually, their theories are only based on faith and bad logic, inferential logic only. They say, in the beginning was the Big Bang. Well, who was there to see the Big Bang? Any of them? No. Any of their instruments? No. So at best, they have second-hand or third-hand, very indirect evidence. And because of this, they have constructed this whole house of cards, you know, of theories. One theory based on another theory. And at the root of it all is the theory that there cannot be a conscious God. You see, and this is the doubt of the Vedic scriptures. This is why the Vedic scriptures have to be accepted to originate from Brahman, from the breathing of the Mahapurusha. Because who was there at the creation? The Purusha was there. Brahman was there. Lord Brahma was there. And they are the ones who originated the Vedic scriptures. It says so right in the scriptures themselves. So if you accept this, then you can know the reality that the world is created by consciousness. Whether you take the view that the material cosmos is created gradually, step by step, from the pradhan through the different worlds and so on. Or whether you take the view of immediate creation, such as Ramana Maharshi and other Vedantists, that the world is there because we create it as consciousness, as the self as Brahman. Either way, consciousness is the creator of the universe. Intelligence shapes the elements into their forms. And there is no evolution of species. There is a devolution from the higher forms like the demigods beginning with Lord Brahma, down to the human species, and then the animals and plants and so on. And that this devolution started even before the world was manifested physically in the pure creation. We talked about the pure creation a lot back in the series on Lakshmi Tantra. So, if you are following this wisdom, this knowledge, then you have a defense against the atheistic Sankhya philosophy. But if you doubt the scriptures, or if you have some anthropomorphic uh, theory, like uh, somebody realized Brahman and then told other people about it, and then eventually they wrote it down, huh? this kind of nonsense, then you're weak. You have no defense against atheism. You have no defense against Sankhya 
mere materialism philosophy. You cannot say, oh no, we have evidence from somebody who was there that the creation was carried out by conscious being, by an intelligent being, by an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent being. And this is Brahman, of course. So this creation exists because he wills it. He wants it. And we discussed some time ago that the material creation is the shadow of Brahman. In order for Brahman to be perfect, to be complete, then he must also contain his own opposite. <laughs> so here we are. We are completing God <laughs> by uh, being sunk in samsara, by being covered by illusion. But God is nothing if not merciful and loving. So he gives the Vedic scriptures to show the way out. If we don't want to be part of the shadow anymore, if we're tired of the round of births and deaths, if we want not to suffer uh, from self-created illusions like the ego, desires, and so on, there's a way out. And it's given in the scriptures. But if we undercut the scriptures by uh, speculation that material creation and so on was simply a, a matter of luck, chance, huh? The scientists say it's all due to chance and the, the material laws. Well, who created the material laws? Even if we accept that the material forms evolve more or less by chance, according to material laws, who made those laws? Why are they made the way they are? See, there's the fingerprints of intelligence all over this creation, in mathematics, in physics, in chemistry. You don't have to dig very far to find them. Why is the radius of a circle multiplied by two pi equal to the circumference? Why? Who decided that? Chance? We don't accept that because the Vedic scriptures say so. They say everything was created by consciousness in the beginning and even down to the present moment. Everything is determined by consciousness. Nothing is determined by chance. Our karma is irrevocable. What will happen in this life is already determined at the moment of birth. That's why astrology works. Vedic astrology, Western astrology is useless. But Vedic astrology shows that fate cannot be cheated. And so we have to follow God's plan. And by worshiping God in many different ways, create the good karma that qualifies us to get out of this material world and to end the suffering of samsara by attaining complete enlightenment. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.